Hello, everyone, and welcome to our series of podcasts on technology, innovation, and development. In today's podcast, we will discover two innovative ways of collecting information in the development and humanitarian field, geographic information systems, GIS, and remote sensing. I'm Eileen, and it is a pleasure to be joined by Eugène Appendi Ocheng. Hello, Eugène. Thank you so much for joining me today to discuss this topic. Hi, Eileen. Uh, thank you very much for hosting me also. First of all, let me introduce you to our audience. Eugène Appendi Ocheng is a geographer and geologist specialized in geographic information systems and remote sensing. He did his bachelor degree in geology at the University of Nairobi and master degree in geography with a specialization in GIS and remote sensing at the Th South Dakota State University. He has offered technical su support for the implementation and operation of GIS related work through digitally processing and anal analyzing GIS and remotely sensed data in order to produce useful cart cartographic maps, statistics, and other geographic information. He has also been coordinating geospatial data collection, management, analysis, and visualization. He is currently working at the Environmental Pulse Institute as associate expert, remote sensing, GIS, and data visualization. Eugène, could you please explain what GIS is, what remote sensing is, and in a broader sense, what do they mean for you? Thank you, Eileen. Uh, let me start with what GIS means for me. Um, it means um, an efficient way of communication, of uh, summarizing information and communicating it with the uh, relevant parties. Uh, in, the, in terms of definition, GIS basically means uh, geographic information system, basically taking information and using a system of computers uh, to map this information onto X and Y coordinates on a map uh, to be able to convey uh, this information uh, in a map format to the end users. The most sensing, on the other hand, is collection of information without being in contact with the subject uh, matter. For example, uh, the taking of images using uh, satellites or uh, drones or cameras that constitutes remote sensing. Back to you. Thank you for this definition. As I said previously, you are a geographer and a geologist, but most, but most of your experience comes from your specialization in GIS and remote sensing. So I'm wondering what led you to this specialization? Uh, it's an interesting story, uh, Eileen. Uh, I started off as a geologist, graduating from the University of Nairobi in 2002. After that, uh, I started my career as a research assistant uh, for some of the professors working at the University of Nairobi. And they were looking at uh, malaria and cholera cases in Lake Victoria Basin. Part of my work col involved collection of data in the field. After the end of the collection of data, we had a one-week workshop uh, introducing all of us to GIS. And from then on, I fell in love with, uh, with, with, with GIS, uh, later on joining South Dakota State University uh, and specializing in GIS and remote sensing. And uh, from then on, uh, my career has, has revolved uh, around the GIS and remote sensing. Thank you. It's really nice to see how passionate you are. As there are a growing number of development and humanitarian organizations that are equipped with such techno technological tools, I wanted to know your point of view and to what extent is this that important to be specialized in GIS and remote sensing in the development or humanitarian field? Like why do we need GIS? And also in which context this, this tool would be more useful um, for instance, is it more efficient in the context of food crisis, poverty, or in a post-war context? I think this is a very important and relevant question, Eileen. Uh, GIS is important in this field because, number one, 
we're able to generalize information uh, and visualize it in a, in a format that people understand quickly that's in our map. And once we do that, then uh, the actors in the humanitarian or development field are able to pinpoint exactly where they need to be on the ground, rather than guessing uh, using you know Excel files or or large tables. Uh, once this information is is mapped uh, and 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 shared, the information just that's generated is able to influence decisions at a higher level, and such decisions can can be life saving or you know. Uh, can impact the lives of those on the ground. And so I think uh, this kind of technologies are relevant in this field because of that. Uh, also, they're relevant because they, they are timely, you're able to do things faster and to share information quickly, particularly uh, because you're able to share information online, you are, you're able to edit information and share it as you edit it online. And so the time difference between when you get uh, data from the field and when uh, information is, is, is put on the desk of, of, a, of a decision maker is much, much shorter. And the decision maker is able to understand this information much better than when you get the raw data from the field. Likewise, remote sensing also helps with gathering of information without getting to the exact uh, to the field. For example, in areas that are, uh, are war zones, most of the time you are not able to go there to measure, for example, water quality, to estimate how much uh, agricultural output is going to be there during a particular year. But using remote sensing tools, you can be able to do this kind of, uh, gather this kind of information remotely and generate uh, data from it and inform decision makers on what they need to, to do in terms of planning or interventions in such areas. Thanks, Eileen. Thank you. Thank you very much for this. Um, Eugène is a former colleague at Impact Initiatives, an organization focused on improving the impact of humanitarian and development action through data partnerships and capacity building programs. Therefore, I had the chance to accompany him in his deployment to Amman, Jordan, to work for the Syrian mission. Since 2011, the conflict across Syria has resulted in severe destruction, large-scale displacement, and an escalating humanitarian crisis. REACH, which is the mission developed by Impact Initiatives in partnerships with ACTED, is the, and it's, which is the one joined by Eugène, started working on Syria in 2012, supporting humanitarian actors operating in the north of the country. Since then, REACH programs provide humanitarian situation, monitoring across the country, and it also conduct, conducts regular sectoral and intersectoral assessments on the needs of populations affected by the conflict. What did your work, Eugène, in Syria consist of? Uh, first of all, as a GIS specialist, my work primarily is to generate relevant information from the data that is collected uh, from the field. Uh, this data comes in, uh, in, in, in a tabular format with the XY coordinate and uh, the GIS specialist have to take it and, and map it and uh, do a special analysis in it and generate information that informs uh, the decision makers and uh, the actors on the field, uh, for example, on where uh, they need to be focusing on, uh, where the populations are in need, etc. Uh, also, part of my work involved uh, a position of GIS officers that were working in various uh, capacities in the mission. Um, I also handled the relationship between uh, REACH and, uh, and other humanitarian actors in terms of uh, spatial data, for example. Um, I also checked the standards uh, of the maps, ensuring that they are all you know, within the quality um, standards of, uh, of impact and REACH. Um, I also participated in the development of strategies, you know, for data collection, strategies for communication, strategies for uh, information sharing within uh, within the organization. And lastly, uh, I, I participated in a proposal writing uh, process. And as you know, uh, most of these organizations depend on uh, on writing proposals and get, getting funding from various donor agencies. So part of my work was also to contribute in in you know in this kind of. Uh, uh, proposal writing uh, for the purpose of funding. Thank you. Thank 
you. Um, could you tell us how crucial is it to have this type of data in Syria? Yeah, uh, GIS information is crucial in a, in a crisis such as Syria because we, we have uh, an intersectoral uh, approach in, in most of, uh, of the activities that we had. Uh, and to combine these in, uh, various uh, information into, into one, uh, one package is kind of difficult if you're not uh, using a, a, a tool like GIS. Within GIS, you're able to combine, for example, uh, healthcare information, uh, education information, uh, food security information, all in one uh, in one map, uh, and this communicates better and faster to to, to the actors, uh, the humanitarian actors in the field. Uh, this is is one of the uh, major advantages that GIS has over uh, other other you know, professions or other sciences, uh, in that we're able to combine information together and overlay it. Uh, and generate in areas of, of main focus areas, uh, and thus uh, we're able to now communicate, you know, to the decision makers to make faster decisions on where they need to put investment, uh, and this uh, helps in you know uh, in speeding up uh, uh, speeding up responses to to areas in need. Thank you very much. Um, I was curious, what type of infrastructure was available in the field to do GIS? Also, um, was there a need to collaborate with the government or did you mostly work with other organizations or the private sector? I, I must say that uh, impact initiatives and REACH uh, and ACTED, for example, uh, provided us with the uh, immaculate uh, infrastructure for conducting our work both in the field and in the offices. Um, I spent 100% of my time in Amman, so I never got to the field in, in, in Syria, but even uh, our compatriots in Syria were able to get the software that they needed. They were able to access internet and they were able to access uh, our servers. And so they, they were able to, you know, uh, continue collecting information on the ground and doing analysis and doing the mapping even in the field and communicating with us uh, in the offices. So in, in, in such, uh, I would say that uh, the, the infrastructure was great. Um, but, and, and then we also communicated and collaborated mostly with international organizations, a little bit with the private sector, uh, because we don't have, uh, I mean, being that we are, we are a humanitarian organization and not for, for, for profit, it's very uh, difficult to collaborate with the private sector, especially because the data that we collect is already paid for by, by donors. Um, most of the collaboration we had with private sector was uh, for data patches in, in, in cases where we could not access the data uh, from other international organizations. For example, we need, when you needed to get satellite images uh, that were not available from other international organizations, we would buy them from uh, the private sector. Thank you. Um, you touched here a lot of inst interesting themes, including data protection that we will discuss later on. As I learned from you, GIS and remote sensing are used to increase our efficiency in collecting information. But would you have any point of improvement to suggest in order to be more efficient, even more efficient? In terms of results, I was wondering also, how, was, how do you get feedback from your maps? What types of results can you see after produce, producing a map in the context of development and humanitarian aid? I think in terms of uh, efficiency, one uh, one factor that I would try to stress is uh, the time duration between uh, when data is captured in the field and when an information product is put out. Uh, I think most of us need to work uh, in shortening that time duration uh, to a minimum as a minimal time uh, possible because, uh, for example, in this uh, humanitarian sector, the situations are usually very fluid. And if you collect data today and uh, take a month or two to produce the information and share it with the with the actors, it might be too late. So we need to work, uh, fast, you know, in a, develop better systems to 
to collect the information and uh, clean up the data, analyze it quickly, and uh, put out information uh, and fact sheets faster so that you can uh, be able to keep up with the changing uh, times on the ground. Uh, secondly, in the question of uh, on, on feedbacks, whenever we put out a product, uh, afterwards we have an M we, we had an M and E uh, monitoring and evaluation uh, unit that would uh, focus on, uh, on 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 the number of users that downloaded this information, the feedback that we got from uh, our partners and the actors on the ground, uh, and that kind of uh, stuff. Uh, and this informed uh, the impact that we had, the information we shared had. We we don't we didn't have a way of measuring whether this you know, the information shared actually resulted on a, on a positive uh, impact on the ground. But I think this is something that you know can be worked on uh, as we go forward. Okay, thank you. Um, we are seeing now a new trend, if I may, which are the participator participatory GIS and crowd mapping. Firstly, could you explain what it is about? Um, and I wanted to know if it was something that you used in Syria. As we have seen, it is done in Syria by other actors already. And I would like to hear your point of view on these methods. Thank you. Uh, participatory GIS or crowd mapping is whereby um, we informally collect information uh, from people that are, have, uh, for example, smartphones uh, in the ground. Um, so basically, they would uh, they would collect information and uh, and upload it into a central database. Then we would download and uh, analyze and uh, and map the information. It is a powerful tool uh, in places that are data scarce. Uh, the only caveat is that we, for you to be able to use this tool, you need to be able to. Uh, maintain some sort of uh, internet connectivity. Uh, this is something that's a challenge in most places that are uh, in a crisis. Uh, whenever the internet connectivity is there and you have sufficient uh, pool of uh, a population that can be able to to use their smartphones for this kind of activity, then it is a it's a major major boost in terms of uh, collecting data in data scarce situations. Uh, secondly, I think the other uh, downtime for using participatory GIS is that you need to be able to set up a system of uh, validating the information coming from from the field because uh, not everybody that is sending you information or data is uh, uh, conversant in what you're trying to achieve with this data and so some of them may not give you uh, accurate information uh, or accurate data from the field and so you must have a system of, uh, of, of validating what comes from the field and uh, and eliminating what looks like uh, suspicion, uh, suspicious data, and keeping what uh, looks like uh, the, the data that you that 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 really. Thank. Very interesting to hear your point of view. Um, there are critiques on GIS, remote sensing, and the use of technology in general, uh, which touches debates like such as data protection, collaboration with the private sector, and the idea that local population are not considered enough. What will be your answer to these critics? Well, uh, one thing I would say is that, uh, I mean, life is a, is a challenge. We, everything in, in life is a challenge, and uh, we have to overcome the challenges by, you know, coming up with the, with the measures or protocols that, uh, that, that, you know, that assist us with. In moving forward, uh, for us, some of the things that we did in terms of data protection was uh, to ensure that we did not share uh, data uh, through email, for example, uh, because we do not have uh, control over uh, over the network that uh, the emails go through. So we had a secure uh, server that we used for sharing data. Uh, secondly, we de-identified the information uh, gathered from the field, and so you are not able to trace information from uh, uh, from our maps or from our fact sheets to the providers of this information. Uh, like, for, for example, if you did a, a household survey in a particular area, there is no way you could be able to relate uh, the responses that we captured to, to a particular household in, in, in an area. Uh, also, to avoid, uh, in terms of data security, we also aggregated information before sharing it. 
uh, such that if we collected uh, data at a household level in a particular area, we would aggregate it to a, uh, a known uh, spatial unit uh, or a political unit before sharing it. Uh, inside. So in this way, nobody is able to uh, to victimize uh, a, responder, a respondent uh, on the ground uh, in terms of the responses that were collected in that particular area. Uh, I think uh, in, the, in terms of not considering considering uh, the local population enough, uh, sometimes it, it's a major challenge because uh, we in in humanitarian sector most of the time you're working in situations where uh, the security even the of even the humanitarian act, um, uh, personnel is not guaranteed, um, and so as much as possible we try to to get the the, the local population involved. Uh, but sometimes it's impossible, uh, and in that case, we use uh, third parties that are able to get access uh, to particular areas that are maybe uh, are restricted in terms of, you know, by war or something like that. Uh, but in, in situations where you have full access, uh, then we always always have that interaction with the with the local population to give us their feedback and to give us the information directly from uh, the host's mouth, you know, so to say. Thanks. Thank you very much for this. It is very interesting to hear the different opinions shaping these debates. And also thank you for sharing uh, an example of policy about data protection. Um, more broadly on these debates, some scholars argue that the evolution of technology and the use of new instruments like AI or drones are threats to development and humanitarian practices. More specifically, that it increases inequalities and relationship of power under the claim of being more efficient. I would like to hear your opinion on this kind of new technology. I assume that for you, they are an asset, but to what extent do you consider that they are an asset? Uh, for me, Eileen, these new technologies are, I think, a class above assets, if there was something like that. Um, number one, they are able to give us information at real time. Uh, for example, if I if I had a, a number a large number of drones or even one drone, I can be able to just uh, fly them from you know from the comfort of my office, gather information rapidly and analyze and and, and publish or uh, uh, you know or, or share. Uh, similarly, artificial intelligence in application application of artificial artificial intelligence in uh, uh, in GIS and remote sensing is giving us much, much, much more accurate results. For example, if you're trying to estimate a uh, population of people in a particular area, for, uh, let's say a country that has not done uh, population census over a long period of time, you can you, we can use uh, you know remote sensing and GIS techniques to estimate uh, uh, a population. And with artificial intelligence uh, or machine learning, this improves accuracy tenfold or maybe a hundredfold uh, and and it's much much cheaper than even conducting a sensor itself I think uh, in, I think you mentioned uh, you know a divide between the those that are able to do it and those that are not at, uh, in my opinion given that uh, these technologies are actually even will uh, drive down cost of conducting data collection and analysis etc they will be able to even bridge that divide much better than uh, things are right now. All you need to do is to focus uh, more on uh, educating people in, in, in these technologies and and how they are applicable in the in, you know in, in GIS and remote sensing and how to you know disseminate information that uh, is generated. Thanks a lot for this. Um, to conclude this discussion. I would like to know what will be the future of GIS and remote sensing for you. Uh, I think in the future of GIS and remote sensing probably is already here. Uh, a lot of improvements will come in, uh, but I think right now we are moving away from uh, you know desktop kind of workstations to online environments and web environments uh, and you know mobile environments. And uh, I mean, Internet of Things, for example, is, is providing information, uh, is providing data uh, from all over the world, uh, the, the so-called big data. 
And I think to capture this, uh, we need to move from, you know, the traditional GIS to uh, to some sort of uh, GIS big data analysis at an, in, in a, on, on, on the cloud, uh, whereby you capture the information and uh, and, and immediately you, you analyze it and, uh, and share it. Uh, one of the examples of this is uh, with Google. Uh, I mean, they're able to capture Android uh, signals and uh, on the roads, and uh, from that they can be able to uh, immediately analyze the data and, uh, and and share it with road users to show you where the traffic there's uh, a lot of traffic and where there is no traffic to you know, and, and that helps in uh, in terms of navigation and faster movement around. And this is the, the future uh, of GIS. Uh, it's kind of powerful uh, and it's online, most of it uh, on the web and uh, on the mobile. Thanks. Thank you so much, Eugene, for giving us your time. Thank you very much, Eileen. Uh, it was nice uh, and I enjoyed it. Bye. Bye bye.